I wasn't asked to give this talk because I uh, witnessed the events. <clears throat> I know some people think I'm a bit older than them. Although my parents did grow up under fascism, and I heard all the stories as I grew up uh, about what it was like uh, to live under the fascist regime. And my father detested the fascists. Uh, he, he really uh, hated them uh, for what they were like and what they, um, what they did. Um, but you see, um, the rise of fascism in Italy in the 1920s was a tragedy of historical proportions because the Italian working class, as the comrades said, could have taken power, not once, but several times in the period 1918 to, I would say, up to including 1921 and possibly even 1922 if the leadership had had a correct policy. But in particular, the two years, 1919-20, in Italian they're called the Biennio Rosso, it's the two red years. If fascism had been defeated and the working class had come to power, it would have changed the history of Europe because Hitler modeled himself on Mussolini's fascists. Germans usually look down on Italians, but in this case, they took a few good ideas from their point of view, I suppose, from the bourgeois point of view, um, and copied the methods of Mussolini. Um, if fascism had not risen in Italy and Germany, we would not have had the Second World War. We would not have had the 55 million dead. We would not have had the concentration camps and all the horrors that humanity lived through um, in, that, um, in that war. Uh, a victory in Italy would have meant uh, a different lesson to the Germans, a different model, i.e. how the working class can take power. And if the Germans had taken, the working class had taken power in Germany, that would have been the end of capitalism in Europe. It would have been a, a European and a world revolution. Stalinism would not have emerged because Rus Russia would not have been isolated. This is how important these events are and how they're all connected uh, to each other. But of course, the working class did not take power. They um, were defeated. Now, the, s the First World War cut across the class struggle in all countries, in, in the beginning, in the first few years. Because in the period just before the World War, there was a growing level of class struggle. That was cut across. But towards the end of the war, things started to change. Now, you all know what happened in Russia in 1917. But um, I just want to give an example of what happened in Italy in August 1917, before these two years which I'm going to talk about. There were bread shortages. The factories were under pressure to produce. There was military discipline in the factories. But there was inflation, high prices, uh, and particularly the shortage of bread. The women in August in Turin went to the bakeries and found there was no bread. This, this kept happening. But one day, the women of Turin decided enough was enough. When they went back to the factories, and a lot of women had been brought into the factories because the men were at the front fighting, um, and when they saw the signs up, no bread, there was a spontaneous strike throughout the whole city of Turin. Workers went from factory to factory, pulling out the other workers, the women giving a lead. You'd think I was talking about Russia, wouldn't you? But I'm not. I'm talking about Italy in August 1917. There was a four-day spontaneous movement. The masses went to the headquarters of the trade unions, demanding a lead. The leaders of the unions, the last thing they wanted was this, because they'd made a deal with the bosses during the war on production, no strikes, and, and you know peace between the classes. They sent the soldiers in. They sent a division of the Alpini. These are the mountain soldiers. They were ordered to shoot, but they didn't. They put their guns down and handed the guns over to the workers, to these women, these unarmed women. There were scenes of the women climbing on tanks to stop them from being used against the workers. That's how revolutionary the situation was in Turin in August of 1917. What did the trade union leaders do? 
they did everything to limit the scope of the movement. A delegation was sent to Milan to ask the, leader of the, social, the leaders of the Socialist Party to spread the movement to the rest of Italy and the conditions were there. They did exactly the opposite. They did everything to hold them back. They even gave leaflets out at one point calling on the workers to go back to work. The result was, of course, they sent in repressive forces. They fired on, on, the, on the workers. The official death toll was 42, but they reckon that at least 500 people were killed in August 1917 in Turin. That is a harbinger of what was to come once the war ended. I think what I just described is sufficient to say that the working class had huge revolutionary potential. Now, the economic background is this, the public debt. Yesterday, we talked about public debt. The public debt in Italy in 1910 was 14 billion lira. In 1920, 10 years later, it was 95 billion. The lira had been devalued. By 1920, it was worth one-fifth of what it was worth in 1914. Overall inflation between 1914 and 1921 was 560 percent. These are the conditions the workers were suffering, and it's the background to that movement of the women and the workers of Turin that I described. Once the war ends, November 1918, we see 1919, an outbreak of strikes, 1,800 strikes involving one and a half million workers in 1919. In 1920, 2,000 strikes involving 2.3 million um, workers. What happened to the workers' organizations? The CGL, the main left union led by this, the socialists, the Socialist Party. In 1918, it had about 250,000 members. Two years later, it had 2,150,000 members. The Metal Workers' Union alone, which started those two years with 11,000 members, shot up to 160,000 members. Here we see the working class turning, in this case, to what were the traditional mass organizations, the Socialist Party and the CGL. Um, and in spite of having betrayed before the war, I, could, I haven't got time here to list the general strikes and the movements which were betrayed by these leaders. In spite of that, when the crisis hit, the masses turned to these organizations. But there was a parallel process. In the factories, the workers were organizing the factory councils. These were de facto embryonic Soviets. They were the workers in the factories electing committees. You didn't have to be a member of the union. It wasn't a union branch. It was the whole of the factory coming together in an assembly and electing their delegates. Um, this was particularly strong in Turin. It started at the Fiat. It spread to all the other engineering plants, and then it spread across Italy. This provoked the hostility of the official union because they saw it as um, competing with their influence um, in the working class. Um, parallel to this, we see the bosses, faced with such a huge movement, beginning to organize. In March 1920, in the middle of a huge movement, the uh, industrialists met in Turin, and they planned out their counter-offensive. Um, they started by sacking shop stewards at, the, at um, uh, Fiat. Um, but in March uh, 1920, you had a strike that spread to all the engineering plants in Turin. It lasted until towards the end of, of April, involving 120,000 workers. In other parts of the country, there was solidarity action developing. But the CGL leaders systematically did everything they could to hold the movement back. For example, D'Aragona, the secretary of the CGL, he went to Turin in the middle of this movement and he negotiated on behalf of the workers, not the factory councils representing, but, uh, but, but he, he, he stepped in negotiating. And what he accepted was a restriction of the powers of the factory councils. Um, a direct collaboration with the bosses in, in this situation. Now, Italy emerged from the First World War with 680,000 dead, half a million injured, and, the, and as I said, tumultuous years of class struggle. The demobilized soldiers were very radicalized. 
Um, I, I described what happened to the CGL membership, but the PSI, the Italian Socialist Party, end of the First World War, had 60,000 members. Within two years, it had 200,000, 215,000 members. Um, this is a whole generation of working class youth, mainly, flooding in to the mass organizations and producing a radicalization. Uh, together with uh, the CGL, there was also the CIL, which was the Catholic Union, which had 1,800,000. By 1920, close to 4 million workers and peasants were organized in some kind of union, which was a five times the level it had been before the war. And with this came widespread radicalization, um, which, which produced also a massive shift to the left within the Socialist Party. This mass of radicalized workers coming in was pushing the party um, to the left. Um, this is in the context, by the way, of a similar process everywhere. I have here the figures for the unions in France who uh, between 1914 and 1920, the CGT alone goes from 1 million to 2.4 million. The unions in Germany go from 2.5 million to 8 million in 1920. Here in the UK, in 1913, 1.5 million members of the unions. In 1920, 4.3 million. In every country in Europe, you saw this massive move of the working class into the unions and pushing them to the left and forcing them um, to take on the bosses. And of course, we have the German Revolution. We have a whole book on that. I'm not going to go into the details. We have the Hungarian Revolution. It was a wave of revolution, and the Italian was one part of this European wave. Politically, this was also expressed in the elections. November 1919, you have the elections. The Socialist Party doubles its votes. It gets 32.3% and wins 156 MPs. It becomes the biggest party in Parliament. Um, next to it, you had the Popular Party, which was a Catholic party promoted by the, the, uh, the, the, the Church, the Vatican, which be emerged as the second party. So you see this radical change inside the Parliament. The Socialist Party takes control of 2,800 councils. That's a quarter of the town councils of Italy. This was the big surge. In 1913, the Socialist Party only had 52 MPs, and it was the third party. So you see how this movement also finds in a political expression. As I said, during the war, wages had been eroded, and this unleashed this wave of strikes um, in 1919, uh, 1920. The demands were, of course, for wage increases to stay in line with inflation, the eight-hour day, a long historical demand of the movement. Um, in February 1919, the engineering workers actually uh, won the eight-hour day with no loss in pay. This is how strong the movement was. July 1919, there was a general strike. The mood was revolutionary. The feeling within the working class was our day has come. And the mood was we can do like the Russians. Russia, the Russian Revolution had a huge impact on the consciousness of the Italian working class. Um, now, the, um, the factory councils, as I said, was this new phenomenon, a spontaneous development within the factories. The socialists of Turin, we didn't have the Communist Party yet, um, Gramsci and his group around a paper called L'Ordine Nuovo, the, the New Order, they promoted and they were very closely linked to the factory councils. This brought them into conflict, by the way, with the national leadership of the Socialist Party, who um, considered it against the line. You know the absurd position, I might refer to this later on, the Socialist Party of Italy was a member of the Communist International. So radicalized was the movement, so strong was the pressure from below, that the Socialist Party leaders were forced to join the Comintern. If you look at the old symbol of the Socialist Party, up until the 1970s, I can remember that, they had the hammer and sickle in the symbol of the party, which was from the days when they were in the Comintern. But the Socialist Party leaders said, no, no, we must form Soviets. And they even had an elaborate plan of the rules and regulations of how the Soviets should function. And yet here in the factories, you had the factory councils, real, genuine um, embryonic Soviets, genuine expressions of the working class, 
and they rejected them because it wasn't against it was against their um, their position. Um, this is a this, this appears systematically throughout the whole process. The paralysis of the leadership of the Socialist Party. Now, the um, the bosses faced with such an onslaught um, were terrified by what they saw, the revolutionary potential. They began to organize. They organized the bosses union. Later on, they organized the landowners union, and they coordinated their actions to try and defeat this rising working class. They decided in August 1920, in a meeting, no more concessions are going to be made to the working class. They had to take on the working class head on. Um, and they threatened to move in the direction of lockouts. Any protest by the workers would be responded with the factory closures. The FIOM, the uh, engineering union of the CGL, held a special congress in Milan. And they voted in favor of the policy which they called obstructionism. You could call it, I suppose, a slowdown or a work to rule in English, i.e. reduce to a minimum production, only, only apply every rule in detail to slow down production. Um, and, if the, and, they, and they announced in that Congress, if the bosses move towards a lockout, we occupy the factories. Um, and that's what happened. At the end of August, the Romeo plant in uh, a car plant, you know, you've heard of Alfa Romeo. Romeo was, uh, was one of the uh, early uh, Italian car companies, had a plant in Milan of about 2,000 workers. They declared a lockout. The Fiom called on the workers and they occupied the 300 engineering factories in Milan. The movement f spread very quickly to Turin, then to Genoa and beyond. Factories were occupied in Rome. They were occupied in Naples. They were occupied in Florence, even in Palermo. You had factories were occupied. But of course, the core was in what was called the Industrial Triangle, Turin, Milan, Genoa, where the working class uh, was at its strongest. And at one point, close to half a million workers were occupying the factories. There was another phenomenon, the Red Guards in Turin. The workers armed themselves in Turin. They controlled neighborhoods. They controlled the roads. They had roadblocks. Production continued in the factories under the control of the working class. Railway workers would send material to the Fiat plant so they had the, 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 the materials to continue producing. The working class was showed for several weeks they were capable of running the factories without the bosses. This terrorized the Italian bourgeoisie. They, they had revolution staring them in, in the face. And the working class had a taste of what was possible. The state in that particular moment was paralyzed. They didn't have the forces to destroy this movement. Giolitti and other leaders were, were, were discussing, we don't have enough troops. If this were to spread to every corner of Italy, the army, the police is not enough. And also, remember what happened in 1917. Some of these soldiers may not have been so trustworthy um, asking them to shoot their own people. So you have this tremendous movement in September 1920. Um, but uh, the leader of the Fiom, Boazzi, um, he announced he was prepared to accept a wage increase. The workers have factory control, the Red Guards. Power was there for the taking. The Socialist Party was the biggest party in Parliament. Um, and yet he turns up negotiating a wage increase. The um, September the 10th, in the middle of the occupation, the CGL leadership meets together with the PSI executive. And um, the PSI talked revolution, but never acted. They said, uh, we are for the, uh, the socialist republic and for the dictatorship of the proletariat. We are for social revolution. The CGL leaders were against that. They met. What did they do? Well, they decided to put it to a ballot. They asked the working class, do you want a revolution or do you want workers' control um, uh, within, within capitalism, obviously? Um, that's actually what happened. They were held a referendum of the CGL membership, by the way. Not the railway workers, not the maritime workers, not the peasants, not the workers who are not in unions, just, just within the CGL. And even then, 590,000 voted for workers' control, 490,000 voted for revolution. 
the uh, leaders of the Socialist Party gave a sigh of relief that their proposal was lost. Look, Nenni, who became a future leader of the Italian Socialist Party, said that the, um, the leadership, the leaders of the PSI um, at that joint meeting had liquidated the political solution. That meant they had liquidated revolution with the cooperation of the party executive. And he says, this is Nenni, who was never a revolutionary, which had wanted to lose. That was the policy of the of these so-called lefts. Tasca explains it, that he said that the leaders of the party gave a sigh of relief. Angela Tasca has written a very good um, analysis of fascism. It's called The, the, the Rise of Fascism. Uh, he was uh, a communist with, board, um, with Gramsci. He lived through the process. He was expelled as a write-up and his position is in 1929 and unfortunately continued to move to the right after that. Um, now, at this moment in time, the fascists are a small force. Mussolini uh, started to organize, but this is how Angela Tasca, Angelo Tasca describes the fascists then. They were anemic and almost non-existent prior to September 1920, um, but they multiply in the last three months of the year. Once the factory occupations were defeated because they were not spread to the rest of Italy. They were isolated and that famous vote to um, basically the, they accepted some wage increases um, which the bosses are always prepared to give. The bosses even gave the eight hour day to the working class. But the, work, the bosses are prepared to give anything if the working class is threatening to take power as long as it serves to demobilize the working class and get it back into the factories. Later on they took it back with a vengeance as I, as I will explain. Um, but Tasca says something important. It is not fascism that defeated the revolution, but the inconsistency of the revolution that promotes the emergence of fascism. Fascism is not the instrument that destroys the revolution. It is the reformist leader of the leaders of the working class that do that. Fascism comes in later, at a, at a second stage. The, the factory occupations had challenged the bosses in their very property rights, they were, they, were, they were terrified and determined to re-establish bourgeois order. In effect, the factory occupations were the swan song of the movement. It was the last real gasp, and it marked a turning point, an a very important turning point, and the beginning of a shift in the balance of forces um, in that period. Now, November 1919, how weak was Mussolini? Well, he stood in the elections in Milan. He got 5,000 votes out of a total of 268,000 votes. That's 1.8%. That's how small he was. He, he was rather disappointed. The Socialist Party in Milan in those elections got over 50%. That was the real balance of forces in 1919. And yet by 1922, this party, the fascists, becomes a huge force. In 1921, they were still weak numerically, although they were on the march. They barely had 30,000 um, uh, vo votes. Um, now, it's interesting to look at the figure of Mussolini. You see, he was the son of a socialist. Uh, a fa his father was a socialist with anarchist inclinations. Uh, this is his background. Um, Mussolini knew what he was talking about when he analyzed the Socialist Party because Mussolini had read Marx and Engels. Um, in 1911, Mussolini led a riot, a protest, against the imperialist, imperialist war of Italy in Libya. He got a five-month jail sentence for that. On his release, he campaigned against the right wing of the Socialist Party. He campaigned to get the right wing expelled from the Socialist Party. That's how left he was. When he was in Switzerland, he worked as a building worker temporarily. He had a medallion around his neck with Karl Marx on it. That's where Mussolini's, that's his background. That's his, his background. But he's like, um, it's interesting to analyze the figure. I think Trotsky does it with Stalin. Uh, Ta Tasker actually says about Mussolini, he was never a socialist. Mussolini was always a Mussolinist, i.e., I come first. Whatever, and I will go down any road that serves that purpose. 
He became the editor of Avanti, the paper of the Socialist Party, a member of the National Executive. He was a very important figure on the left of the party. And when the First World War um, broke out, he was still against the war in the very early days. But a little bit like Boris Johnson when he had those two articles about whether to leave or join the European Union. You know, he was weighing up, which is the best one? Apparently, uh, Tasker explains it, um, he saw the mood in the party was still anti-war, so he published an article um, anti-war. But in private meetings, he was declaring his sympathies for intervention, and he was exposed publicly for that. You privately say you're for the war. He realized that he was going to be exposed. He shifted very quickly. He, uh, he, he put all his money on the, the intervention, and he came out in favor of Italy joining the um, First World War, which it did in 1915. That led to a break between Mussolini and the Socialist Party. He launched his own paper, Popolo d'Italia, financed by bourgeois. Um, he started to get a taste for money. Tasca describes how Mussolini, in the later, later, he was no longer that bohemian, rough-looking guy. He was wearing the smart suits, and he was having a good life. He's starting to get a taste for money and uh, bourgeois friends. But he sets up the first fasci. Now, you know, fascia in Italian just means bundle. So fascism means bundleism. And if you're a fascist, you're a bundleist. Um, because it comes from the old Roman Empire symbol of the fasci, which is a bundle, which means you tie it together and it gives you strength with an axe in, in it. That was the symbol of, of, uh, um, uh, from, from the days of the old Roman Empire. They took it on as a symbol and the name. Um, now, Mussolini was very ambitious personally, had no scruples and no principles. Tasca explains he's, he would be prepared to use any idea to destroy the, 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 the enemy of the day. And he would shift his position the next day. He had, he had no problems in, in changing his, his ideas. He abandons the class struggle, and he becomes basically a bourgeois uh, populist, demagogue, nationalist, but with a lot of rhetoric and left. I, I will quote the program in a minute. Now, as I said, there was a the very powerful influence of the Russian Revolution in the period 1917-21. The CGL itself was playing with the idea of a constituent assembly. The PSI executive was, was further to the left. Their position, quote, was for the Socialist Republic and the dictatorship of the proletariat. That was formally the leadership of the Socialist Party. But as I said, a lot of talk, but no action. Um, but it reflected the mood in, in, in the ranks. At the same time, as the working class was moving, we have to um, remember there was a huge movement of the peasants. Now, Italy was still fundamental, overwhelmingly a peasant um, nation. Over 50%, 55% of GDP, I think, was agriculture, although industry had already become an important part of that. The peasantry was on the move. There were massive land occupations um, in Italy, particularly in the south. In Sicily, it was very strong. In some provinces, the entire Latifundia, all the land of the landlords, was, uh, were occupied and taken over by the landless peasants, often led by the ex-soldiers who had been demobilized. In Trapani, for example, in the province of Sicily, 150,000 peasants involved in the land occupations. Not a single socialist MP went there to talk to the peasants. They didn't turn to them. They didn't raise the slogan of land to the peasants. Serrati, who was the leader of the party, he said this about this movement which was led by ex-soldiers and, and popular party activists. He defined it a petty bourgeois demagogic movement. It's incredible when you read this, this history and you see what they did. All the Socialist Party had to do was say, land to the peasants, and the popular party would have been destroyed. Gramsci actually says at one point, the popular party stands to the socialists, he got his, he got his par compa comparisons a little bit wrong, like the Mensheviks to the Bolsheviks. What he meant was, we can destroy the popular party. But the only way that could have been done was if the Socialist Party had adopted the slogan, land to the peasants. They never adopted that slogan. Um, and therefore, the popular party was able to hold on to the peasantry 
and behind the popular party and the leader of the popular party was a Catholic priest, was the Catholic Church. It was set up as a, as, as a, as a, as a bulwark, of, 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 as a barrier, you could say, between the peasantry and, and the working class. Um, but it wasn't just the peasantry which had um, radicalized and was on the march. For the Socialist Party to have won so many votes in 1919, it meant a significant layer of the middle classes in the cities had turned to the left. Even the shopkeepers, the professional people, these people were radicalized to the left. They were looking to the Socialist Party. They'd been told the Socialists want revolution, and they looked for revolution in the, in the Socialist Party. But the Socialist Party did not lead, did not act. The CGL leaders consciously tried to hold the movement back, and the, and the Socialist Party leaders betrayed the movement at every um, step. Um, now, this explains why the original program of the fascists was, you could say, almost socialist. In fact, the Germans call themselves national socialists. It wasn't by chance. Mussolini, 1919. Of course, Mussolini wasn't, as I said, he had no principles and he had no intention of applying this program. But the founding, con uh, founding program in 1919 of the fascists was this. I'll read it to you. Universal suffrage. Votes for women. The abolition of the Senate. That's like abolishing the House of Lords here. Uh, the call for a kind of constituent assembly, for a republic, for the eight-hour day, for the minimum wage, for workers' participation in industry, not ownership, participation, social security, pensions at the age of 55, a special tax on capital, expropriation of church property, and even sequestering 85% of war profits. Now, that's what you call quite a, ra a radical program. But it shows you how they built up their init initial base by presenting themselves like this. Mussolini, after all, remember, he was still seen as coming from within the socialist movement, the le a leader of the left of the socialist movement. At one point, the fascists even adopted the slogan, the land to those who till it. They went further than the socialists, and they were e they, then they would poke fun. They would say to the peasants, you see the socialists, they promise you this and they promise you that, and they give you nothing. But we are, we are giving you all, all of this. Of course, they didn't actually give very much. Um, but you can see how this can begin to develop a movement. But combined with this, of course, is the nationalist rhetoric, the idea that Italy um, had been badly treated after the First World War. It didn't get Fiume, which they claimed as Italian. They, it didn't get um, Dalmatia, the coast of Yugoslavia. And also Mussolini claimed that Italy has a right to colonies, like all the others. The English have their colonies. He, he used to take the piss out of the British. They talk about democracy. Look at their empire. Look at what they're doing. We want a bit too. That was his position, basically. Um, he was pandering to the nationalism of the period. Now, he never went back to the program of 1919. That was just pure demagogy. He actually says later on, we don't have preconceived doctrines. We just have action. Now, in July 1919, they had 17,000 members, still a small force. In effect, its time had not yet come. The bourgeois could not move directly against the working class in 1919. That's why I was saying it's not fascism that destroys the movement. The bourgeois were playing with the idea of bringing the Socialist Party into the government. They offered Turati, come into the government. He had to say, I'm sorry, I can't. Not because he didn't want to. He says, my people wouldn't follow me. Basically, the party would not support it. In fact, the party had an official position of no collaboration. Um, but there is a, uh, I can't quote it here, there's a, there's a phone conversation between a liberal MP, Amendola, and the editor of the Corriere della Sera, uh, 15th of September, 1920. And um, Amendola says, but what can we do in this situation? This is at the height of the factory occupations. And the editor of the Correa de la Sierra says, give power to the General Confederation of Labor, to the Union. And the, and the liberal says, but that's extreme. No, 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 he says. It's much better than what we have now. Um, we cannot go along, go, continue like this. And the liberal says, but so you're saying basically let them carry out the revolution and that's the end of it. Just give up. Um, but what can, and he says, what can we do? He says, 
precisely in order to avoid the revolution, we call the union leaders into the government. This was the conversation that was taking place. Now, by the time, of course, we get to the defeat of the factory um, occupations, that becomes less urgent for the bourgeois. The movement was already beginning to ebb and was in decline. Um, and what we have is uh, Mussolini and his squads stepping up their action. The last three months of 1920 and the first six months of 1921, a systematic campaign, armed gangs financed by the bourgeois moving around town after town in Ferrara, in Bologna. In Bologna, it started with a bomb thrown at a demonstration. Um, this, was, this was in 1919, in the early days. But later on, it became common shooting at demonstrations. They would go to the headquarters in Milan, say to the, to the mayor and, the, and the, the socialist held council, and at gunpoint forced them to resign. They would take over the council. And they did this systematically, town after town after town, burning down the headquarters of, the, of um, the Socialist Party, the Communist Party, the trade unions, printing presses. They destroyed over 700 buildings. The gang would turn up and they'd burn the whole building down. At least 500 people were killed in this um, campaign of terror. And Mussolini, you know what he said? At one point when he, he said, and what are the socialists doing? Are they organizing any protests? Are they organizing any reprisals? He said no. He knew them. He knew that they were incapable. You know what they would do? There would be an attack. They'd call, they'd call a, region, a, ro a local general strike, but no physical organized attack on the fascists. In, um, in February 1920, in an article, Mussolini, he talked about the socialists, he talked about their, their reformist nothingness and their revolutionary nothingness. In the sense, they do nothing real in Parliament and they do nothing real on the streets. He knew exactly who he was dealing with. If the Socialist Party, basing itself, for instance, on the Red Guards of Turin and spreading that to all the cities, armed squads, every time a fascist attack took place, you go to them and you attack them and you physically destroy them, Mussolini would have been destroyed. He could have been destroyed. But they never, ever did this. Um, time is running out, and I have to describe a whole historical period. Um, I will move on, move on as fast as I can. Um, the, um, uh, it, this, is, this is, talk about being warned. This is what Mussolini said at one point. He said, describing the socialists, this is in the 1st of April 1920 in the Popolo d'Italia. He said, one could add that the crisis of socialism, he meant the Socialist Party, is even more serious and more tragic than that which troubles the ruling political classes of the old world. Then he talk, he, he's, as if he's talking to the socialists. You do not need songs and slogans, O oh comrades of socialism. No drunken verbiage, no comedy of gestures. If you thought about tomorrow and the fate that may await you, your veins and wrists would tremble. It is said that there is a bourgeois atonement, but one forgets to add that tomorrow there may be an analogous socialist atonement. He's basically saying, we are going to make you pay, and you're going to pay dearly. Um, it was a clear warning. Socialist party leaders, they continue to appeal to democracy and the institutions and parliament, etc. Now, this... This is what produced the, the split in the Socialist Party in January 1921, led by Bordiga. Gramsci was also a leading figure. And it then becomes the official section. They take about a third, roughly, about 60,000 of the membership uh, represented that Congress um, split to form the Communist Party of Italy. Unfortunately, and here, the Communists also played a role in defeating the working class, because they emerged under the leadership of Bordiga, who was an ultra-left. He under underestimated fascism right till the very end. He said it would never take place. And then they also had a weakness in that they said all reaction was the same. The fascists are no different. All of the reaction, they're all, they're all reactionary expressions of the bourgeoisie. They rejected the United Front, the policy of the Comintern, which Lenin 
if you read Len uh, Lenin, um, um, left-wing communism infantile disorder, it's written precisely to educate the leadership of the communist parties, but they rejected it. The bourgeois was on the offensive, financing and organizing armed squads and fascists from city to city, and killing hundreds of socialists and communists, um, et cetera, et cetera, and also destroying the union and building the fascist unions. In June 1922, for example, the fascist union had reached almost half a million members. By 1923, the CGL had been reduced to one-tenth of the strength it had in 1920. But in, sp in spite of all this lack of leadership, you see the tremendous spirit of the Italian working class. In, in early 1921, they forced the leaders to come together in the Alianza del Lavoro, the, uh, the Workers' Alliance, which was an alliance of all the workers' organizations, the CGL, the UC, which is the Syndicalist Union, the WIL, the Seafarers' Union, the Railway Workers' Union. They come together as an alliance. Um, and, and it was the pressure of the rank and file trying to form a unity of the working class and its organizations to combat the fascists. They were under direct threat. They were being killed. They were being burnt. Uh, the headquarters were being burnt, etc. When this was formed, the communists were invited to attend. They declined. They just sent a letter. Um, Gramsci explained correctly that for the alliance to develop, it had to have roots and a network at the rank and file level, committees in the workplaces, etc., which is the last thing the reformists wanted. The reformists had control of the workers' alliance. Um, all decisions had to be unanimous, so there was a veto. Um, but the, um, the, um, the, you, you, you see what, what happens here. The movement continues to, to, to undergo the attacks, and... In um, the end of July, under this pressure, through the uh, Workers' Alliance, a general strike is called. It's called the Sciopero Legalitario, the legalistic strike. Why is it called that? Because the aims of the strike, this is the incredible thing about this, was it was organized to appeal to the bourgeois in parliament to defend democracy to use the state forces to fight the fascists. Instead of fighting them themselves, they appealed to the ruling class. They appealed to the ruling class when the ruling class was financing the fascists. They appealed to Giolitti when Giolitti was already maneuvering with the fascists. This is, this is the incredible scenario that we have. Side by side with the Workers' Alliance emerged the Arditi del Popolo. This was a spontaneous movement led by ex-soldiers who had experience in fighting, who took guns where they could and organized um, uh, armed resistance. But the Socialist Party was against the Communist Party. The Communist Party leadership, because it wasn't under their leadership, sent a circular to the members of the party who were spontaneously joining the Arditi del Popolo to withdraw because their aim is to defend democracy and not socialism. This is the pure sectarianism of the leadership of the Communist Party. They split the working class in, in this situation, and the Arditi del Popolo, which could have become the armed resistance of the, of the uh, Italian working class, went down to defeat. In a few areas, like Parma, you see the potential. A four-day resistance, barricades. The state had to come in with machine guns to defeat were armed, that the working class was fighting back in every neighborhood. The same happened in Bari and other areas. But these were isolated cases where the local leadership wasn't firmly under the control of the socialists or the communists. So the general strike, the legal general strike, flopped. The fascists gave a 48-hour warning. You end the strike or we come for you. The, the strike was called off and it was a, a major... Um, defeat of the working class. The fascists went on the offensive and stepped up their attacks. By now, the balance of forces had massively shifted in, um, in favor of the fascists. In August, they were already talking about um, the uh, march on Rome. They, the rumors were spreading everywhere. Um, and the Petty bourgeois, 
were disillusioned. The urban petty bourgeois were disillusioned with the socialists. They promised revolution. They never did it. The fascists come along and they say, we're the guys who can do, we're the, we're the men of action. We'll sort out this mess. Um, the same with the, the peasants. Um, and th although there were armed conflicts that continued in that period, the movement was um, going down. And yet, in spite of this, in the May 1921 elections, although the socialists and communists presented themselves split in two parties, their overall vote held, mo more or less held up. There was a very small fall. But here's where the maneuver comes. The very same liberals that the socialists were appealing to form a block with Mussolini, the national block. It's a coalition that stands in the elections, gets over 100 MPs. 35 of those MPs are fascists. One of them is Mussolini. This is how he gets into parliament, not by having some massive vote and landslide towards him, but with the collaboration of the, uh, the uh, liberals. Then, um, I have to speed up. I have enough here for about two hours. But um, the, um, another element, in 1921, mass unemployment emerges. The unemployed start to get used, to get organized. The reserve army of labor, as Marx referred to it, is used against the organized working class. The, um, the landowners, the middle classes, the shopkeepers, the, the capitalists, the professionals, the civil servants, the white collar staff, and curiously, the teachers and the students. Things have changed a little bit today. Um, these were all part of the base of the fascist organization. And um, in October, the situation reaches ahead. The, the outgoing, I have to skip stuff here, unfortunately. The outgoing government, the last government, the factor government, resigns. We, we had um, very weak bourgeois liberal governments at this moment in time. The fascists are organizing their squads. They're marching towards Rome, camping uh, in different towns around Rome. Mussolini um, goes to Milan. They've always said Mussolini was hedging his bets. Milan, you see, the advantages of Milan is that if it went badly, he could very quickly get a train to Switzerland. Um, but what happened was, Factor resigned, issued on paper a state of emergency. A state of emergency would have meant the army and the police would have to be used against the armed fascists. The king, using the powers that the king has, and Charles has those same powers here, remember that, refused to sign the decree for the state of emergency, which meant the army barracks and the police were not ordered to mobilize, but furthermore, they wouldn't have obeyed anyway because they were riddled with fascists, army officers, police chiefs everywhere, sympathized. They collaborated. The march on Rome was a farce. There was no march on Rome in the sense there was no armed organization of the fascists that marched into Rome and took power. What happened was Mussolini was in Milan, Factor resigns, they offer the premiership to Mussolini. The king calls Mussolini and says, come back to Rome. Mussolini was very cheeky. He said, unless you send me a telegram in a written statement that you are giving me the job of premier, I'm not coming. So the king obediently sent a telegram, please come to Rome and take up the premiership. So Mussolini, very comfortably, he got on a sleeper train at night in Milan and arrived in Rome the next day went to the king and accepted. He was a member of parliament after all. He accepted the task of forming a coalition. Then the fascists were allowed to come into Rome and they had their victory parade and they all marched gloriously um, uh, through Rome. But there was no armed takeover. There was the state collaborating and handing over power to the fascists because they, they needed them to destroy what was left of the movement of the working class. Mussolini, with 35 MPs, could not form a government. Who did he form the government with? All the parties in parliament except the socialists and the communists. The same people the socialists had been appealing to to defend democracy are forming a government with, this, um, with, with Mussolini. Then what do they do? They change the electoral law. The electoral law is any party that gets more than 25% gets a majority in parliament. By then, the fascists were on the march. They had over 300,000 members. The, the left was completely demoralized and, and um, 
and, and, uh, and destroyed. And he took an absolute majority and then proceeded to impose the fascist laws, banned the unions, banned the parties, arrested all its leaders, and didn't even thank the trade union leaders. Incredibly, incredibly at one point, D'Aragona, the leader of the CGL, was offered a place in the government by Mussolini. Imagine that, a, a, the TUC leader being, being, being brought into Mosley's government in the 30s. He accepted. He didn't go into it because the, uh, the more extreme fascists weren't too keen on it. They wouldn't let him in. But these people were arrested, imprisoned. Bozzi himself, the leader of the uh, engineering works, was shot by the Nazis later on. Um, they don't, they don't, um, uh, there's, there's no recognition of the role of the uh, traitors of the working class. And then, of course, the fascist regime was imposed. If you want to know what the essence of fascism is, they tore up all the labor contracts, they increased the working week, they cut wages, and I saw one statistic which showed that the, the real average wage of workers in Italy in that 20-year period was cut by an overall 25%, because they had to destroy the organizations of the working class because they still represented a force that could negotiate wage increases, working conditions. The fascists were the tool of the Italian uh, ruling class in destroying those organizations and preparing the 20 years of fascist dictatorship, um, which we then saw. Now, I've got a lot more I'd like to say, but as you can see, I think you can see if the Socialist Party had had the program of the Bolsheviks, they could have taken power. Conditions in Italy were far more favorable than they were in Russia. They go around saying that it wasn't. It's the opposite. The working class was stronger. The movement was, uh, was more widespread. The labor organizations were far stronger. And they even had the biggest party in parliament. They could have easily swept capitalism aside, but they didn't, and they played a role in handing over the working class to, um, to the capitalists without even a serious fight, in spite of all the attempts of the workers to do so. Now, I've, I've got a lot more. Some of the points maybe I could take up in the conclusions, but that is what happened in the 1920s in Italy. Excellent.